In the mountains of Peru rises the ancient fortress city of Machu Picchu. It was here many long years before white men knew there was such a place as America, for it was built by the Incas. They were great masters of stonework. They built temples and dwellings, highways and bridges. They made their empire the mightiest of its time, a land in which there was much useful work and much beauty and no poverty. Machu Picchu was a mountain refuge, a fortress in times of strife, and in peace, a city in which men, women, and children lived amid lofty peaks. A sundial which reckoned time a thousand years ago. The Inca Empire reached north and south nearly 3,000 miles, from what today is Ecuador to central Chile. Then suddenly, violently, all was changed. From Spain came Francisco Pizarro, drawn by the fabled riches of Peru. At Panama he paused, gathered his followers. Then on to Peru, where with his small army, he conquered the Inca land of 10 million Indians. The Spaniards, the conquerors, brought to this new world the look of the old. On Inca walls, they raised their Spanish houses. Their churches rest on the walls of temples where the Incas worshiped the sun. All that was Spanish was laid upon all that was Indian, upon the old ways of life as well as upon the old stones. The conquerors and the colonists who followed brought the faith of their homeland and in its cause built many enduring churches. In the beginning, the Spaniards came for gold but they stayed, they and their sons, to rule the land as Spain in the New World. In the highland villages, old Indian ways persist. On festival days, their religion emerges as a mixture of Christian forms and old pagan rites. Household saints are carried to the church to be blessed. The festival is a blend of genuine piety and of wild carousing, and the accompanying beverage is chicha, which is brewed from corn. The Indians in their dances still poke a good deal of satirical fun at the Spanish invaders. The masks and costumes are travesties of the conquistadores. On the coastal plain, Pizarro founded Lima in 1535. For many years, the city of Kings was the fountainhead of the life of Spain as it was lived in South America. Here flourished a new aristocracy. Here centered the social, official, and commercial affairs of nearly the whole continent. Lima is still Peru's capital and largest city and is rapidly acquiring the look of a modern metropolis. Lima inherits a tradition of aristocracy. Its well-to-do are often descendants of the great landowners of the days of the Viceroyalty. Among these people, life has lived graciously amid pleasant surroundings, but they are a small and diminishing minority. Peru's coastal region, between the mountains and the sea, is a desert 1,400 miles long, scarcely 50 miles wide, utterly barren, except for irrigated oases in the valleys of small streams struggling down from the Andes. Stretching along the desert are roads, Peru's only means of travel between north and south, excepting coastal vessels.
Now, farther south, we are edging over into the mountains. At the end of the road, the city of Arequipa rests in an oasis 8,000 feet above the sea. It is a study in the colonial architecture of Peru. Arequipa is commercially important, for it is on the ancient trade routes, which now have become the lines followed by modern railroads from the coast into the interior. Taking train at Arequipa, we remember Peru as threefold. Coastal desert, mountains, jungles. The railroad shows us high Peru. Much of the country's area, and much more than half of all its people, are found here at altitudes of from 10,000 to 15,000 feet above the sea. Here in the Altiplano are plateaus for the farmlands and the towns. Below the plateaus are deep canyon-like valleys. And above the plateaus are fabulously high peaks. High Peru is bleak and cold. And its people live here generation after generation, unquestioningly and indifferent to the world outside. Indian women operate the Andean equivalent of the station lunchroom. These small objects are frozen potatoes. Further north, on its way to the copper mines, another line takes railroading to its all-time peak of picturesqueness. This railway abounds in incredible tunnels and bridges and crosses the Andes at a height of 15,680 feet. Here in the highlands, where the Incas found their gold and where silver has been mined for centuries, the important ore is now copper. The mines are more than 14,000 feet above sea level. The miners are Indians, or cholos with a strong strain of Indian blood, who are used to breathing and working at such altitudes. Close by the sea, in the northwest corner of the country, Peru has rich deposits of petroleum. Pizarro would have been astonished to learn as he sailed along this coast 400 years ago that hidden beneath the shores was a treasure more valuable than all the gold he was seeking. For now, petroleum is Peru's most important export. Most of it is shipped in the crude state for refining abroad. Peru by no means rivals Venezuela in petroleum production. Still, 15 million barrels or so a year is impressive. Like most of the other mineral deposits, the petroleum is largely owned and sold by foreign interests. Transportation between the coast and the lowlands is a major problem, for the Andes rise like a great barrier. By sea around to the Atlantic and up the Amazon is a voyage of 7,000 miles and takes two months, but nearly all merchandise must go this way. 
The land route takes time too, six to eight days by a road which climbs and winds over the mountains, and then by small river boat to Iquitos at the head of navigation on the Amazon. But from Lima, a plane can make the 650 mile flight to Iquitos in six hours. And now we are over the low-lying hinterland, where Peru shares an immensely vast jungle with its neighbor nations. A third of Peru's total area is here, but less than one twentieth of its population. Iquitos is set in the heart of the huge and forbidding jungle. It is so remote that most Peruvians never see it. It is out of their world. Yet this little Amazon city is the commercial center of a large part of their country. Civic pride in the jungle. Iquitos parades in its best bib and tucker. It's a fine show to be put on by the folks of a town so isolated. The importance of Iquitos lies in the fact that it is the terminus of the 2300 mile river route to the Atlantic. These are sleeping quarters for crew members and third-class passengers. The unsuspecting goat is a part of the boat's food supply, and so are the cattle. Iquitos is the main shipping point for cotton from the eastern valleys of the Andes, and for the jungle products, rubber, tobacco, mahogany. So the Indians find here, among the town's workers, a market for the produce of their small clearings in the jungle. These boats are loaded with ammunition, or rather raw material for ammunition, for guns to kill insects. It is barbasco. This is mahogany, which grows wild in the jungle. It is safe to say that few of us ever saw so much mahogany in one place. A lot of the mahogany starts here on journeys far to the north. This is something new, plantation mahogany, as distinguished from the wild growth. The trees we see here are about eight years old. The gathering of wild rubber still keeps a good many of the forest dwellers busy. Gathering the latex from the rubber trees is slow work, done in a monotonously hot and humid climate. For years, Malaya has outstripped South America in production, but with the disruption of the Far Eastern supply, rubber from the Amazon region has taken on renewed importance. Every pound is precious. Some Peruvians are decidedly of the opinion that rubber will have a great revival, that the other jungle products will also increase in importance, and that the Amazon lowlands hold Peru's best hope for the future. The latex is prepared in two ways. Here it is being smoked into sheets on a revolving drum. This is rubber prepared the other way, in great balls. Peruvian rubber is of good quality. Whether or not great developments take place in the Amazon country, Peru's agriculture is a real hope for the future. Consider first the coastal region. 
Water from the high Andes spreads among the lesser hills, bringing fertility to the semi-tropical valleys. Some streams, about 50, reach the coastal desert. A few reach the sea. In their valleys, these small rivers, with the help of man, produce oases where agriculture is richly productive, mainly of sugar and cotton. Sugarcane thrives in these coastal oases. In the midst of a plantation such as this one at Chiclin, it is hard to believe that the coastal strip, except for such scattered places, is truly a desert, with only about 3% of its area under cultivation. At Chiclin Hacienda, we find the coastal farmland at its best. Even the hogs prosper in a large way. The attractiveness of Chiclin and its community life make it the showplace of the coastal region. These well-drilled youngsters are all children of workers on Chiclin Hacienda. And for the grown-ups, the marinera. In the valleys of the lower Andes, Terraces a thousand years old show that the Incas knew how to irrigate their land. Amid the slopes and valleys of the Great Sierra, the great basic crops are possible. Wheat, corn, barley, oats, potatoes. Irrigation is essential and widely and expertly used. Fully half of all Peru's crops are from irrigated lands. The very word Peru is likely to bring first to many of us a mental picture of mines and mountains. Yet the truth is that of all its seven million people, more than nine-tenths live from the soil. Also, nine-tenths of Peru's population are Indians or of mixed Indian and Spanish blood. By nature and tradition, these people are inclined less to mining and industry than to agriculture. In the farmlands of the Andean slopes, both old ways and new ways prevail. Not always do all the old give way to the new. For instance, this is a very ancient method of threshing. farmer who owns a motor to power his threshing machine is so proud of it, so careful of it, that you may be sure that after the day's work is done, he will take the motor right into his house for safekeeping overnight. But more is in the safekeeping of the farmers of Peru than their motors and their animals and their acres. It is not too much to say that the welfare of the country is in their hands. <laughs> <laughs> 